I was struck by a memory the other day. I'm, I'm maybe 15 years old at the time, and my dad is in the midst of a furious screed about French fries. Now, now, this in itself is not all that noteworthy. My dad had a habit of working himself into an apoplectic rage about inanimate objects. I, I mean, I, I obviously get it from somewhere. But in this instance, the target of his tirade was how much better McDonald's French fries used to be. See, until 1990, McDonald's cooked their French fries in a combination of vegetable oil and beef tallow, which is you know, slightly healthier than giving kids chicken fried cigarettes, but not by much. So a bunch of parents groups pressured McDonald's into changing out to all vegetable oil in 1990. And, and good intentions or no, in my dad's mind, the taste of his French fries was too high a price to pay for healthier children. Of course, in an effort to justify his fury, he had to make it about more than fried potato sticks, so he explained that it was a symptom of oppression. It was tyranny of the fitness freaks. His words, as I recall them, were, it's a shame that a small group of people complaining can screw things up for everybody. Now, even at 15, I could see that that was a ridiculous statement. McDonald's wasn't changing their preparation method to appease a minority. If most people wanted bacon grease slathered on their French fries, that's exactly what McDonald's would sell them. But people were getting more and more health conscious around then, and McDonald's business had been declining for years because of it. In other words, they were making this change in response to the exact market forces that conservatives like my dad idolize. What was actually happening was that my dad found himself in the minority, but that very concept triggers cognitive dissonance in middle-aged, middle-income conservative white men, so he conjured up an imaginary majority that, against all the evidence to the contrary, agreed with him. Of course, conjuring up imaginary majorities is nothing new to conservatism. Richard Nixon dubbed them the silent majority in a 1969 televised address about how, despite ubiquitous protests all over the country, most people still agreed with him that the Vietnam War was going great. Up until then, the silent majority was a euphemism for dead people. Nixon turned it into a euphemism for making dead people. Ten years later, Jerry Falwell Sr. christened his bigotry-based political organization the moral majority, despite being neither of those things. But the fiction he had to tell his followers was that there was this vast number of people withholding from the national political discourse that also agreed with them. It wasn't that they were an ever less relevant political force doomed by the inexorable momentum of demographics, but rather it's that they were part of a secret majority whose voice was being inexplicably excluded from the national conversation. And of course, this isn't some tactic that's relegated to the past. It's why some lady in Tupelo calls herself one million moms. It's why conservatives complain about cancel culture whenever the free market forces in the entertainment industry don't swing their way. It's why their rhetoric so often contains allusions to real Americans who live in the heartland and have wheat or grease-related jobs. It's why they're so terrified by the increasing visibility of people who don't look like them. Right? Like every black lady in a Star Wars property is another reminder that their majority is a fiction. I bring this up because I, I think we atheists too often lose sight of this fact. It's, it's easy for us to do. I mean, obviously, the non-religious overrepresent people who don't mind standing outside the majority. We're far more likely to idealize independent thought and nonconformity. Now, whether we live up to those ideals is a different thing altogether. But for the purposes of the point I'm making here, it doesn't matter. Right. The, the, the point is, we don't have the same need to be broadly agreed with as they do. And because of that, we're likely to underestimate the importance of being open about our atheism. Of course, whenever I bring up visibility, I, I feel the need to caveat that with a list of exceptions for personal circumstance. Right. You, you're the best judge of whether you should be vocal about your disbelief. And I wouldn't encourage anybody to do so if they felt there was a legitimate threat to their health or, or to their income or, or whatever. But for the rest of us, it's important to be reminded sometimes that it does actually matter. I've talked with atheists who equate wearing atheist T-shirts or having atheist bumper stickers to trolling, right? Like as though the only purpose of proclaiming one's atheism is to antagonize Christians. But that's just not the case. It matters. It matters because the, a lot of these Christians can only spackle over that cognitive dissonance for so long. Their innate desire to follow the crowd can defend itself for a while with the familiar tactics of exclusion and imagination. But every time they come face to face with it, we've taken another chip out of that armor. And once we break through, that desire to follow the crowd can't help but manifest itself in following the crowd. 